Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. So, Virginia Held is saying in this essay that moral theory has to be completely transformed. So, what does that mean? She's saying there have been some things left out, and we'll look at the things that have been left out. I put them up on the board here already. Um, we're going to look at each of those in, in a little bit more detail. But why does it have to be completely transformed? Why, why can't we just sort of like do, you know, fix this, fix this, fix this? Her view, and a lot of people uh, in the ethics of care see things this way, is that throughout the history of ethics, it's always been male-dominated. And so when any, when any particular discourse or idea or institution is dominated by one group, what do you think usually happens? How do things work out? Let's say we put you know, women and men aside and we talk about um, you know, a society in which there's some people of this religion and then a minority of this religion. How do things usually get you know, set up in that society? Usually fairly? Or do some people's ideas and views and sentiments get kind of pushed to the side? What's your experience? We don't even have to use it like that. We could just think about um, more mundane things. Think about what you like to eat. Do any of you have tastes that differ from the rest of your family? And you find yourself being overruled? And you would like to have something else? And if you want to have that something else, you better make it yourself because they're not going to get it. Or, you know, it could be this way with sports teams. Everybody in your family is a such-and-such -such fan, and you're the one holdout for this other group. And what are you going to watch on the TV when, when the two games are going on at the same time? It's going to be what most people want to watch. And, it, you know, if, it's, if we're talking about women and men, now we're not talking about a minority and a majority. We're talking about, you know, close to 50-50 in most societies. Um, and through history, you know, most societies have been male-dominated, right? So it would make sense that a lot of women's concerns or experiences would get left out or put to the side, not necessarily because anybody said, hey, let's, let's stick it to the women, you know, we want to make sure that they don't get any stake in this, but just because that's a natural human tendency. Um, we all tend to privilege our own point of view, don't we, when we, we're connected with other people. Um, we can learn to overcome that, but that's a, a natural tendency. So Virginia Held's view is that um, moral theory has left out or devaluated women's perspectives, women's experiences, and that's done some real harm, um, not just to women, but actually also to men, and to our ability to think about right and wrong and good and bad. So she, here's a nice passage that she, she has. She says, moral theory is so far developed is incapable of correcting itself without an almost total transformation. So that's a pretty radical thing to say. It has to have an almost total transformation. It cannot simply absorb the gender that's been left behind, even if both genders would want to. And here we get to um, an interesting split between different ways in which feminism is understood. So I'm not going to go very deep into this because there's, there's a lot of you know, other stuff out there that you can, you can access. There's more than one way to look at feminism. Two of the big ways are what you might call equality feminism and then gender feminism. And these are kind of arbitrary names that I'm, I'm just putting to them. This isn't what everybody calls it. Equality feminism is the idea that Look, the, the, the playing field is unequal. Say, let's say women's wages. Women's wages are, are uh, lower. We need to make it equal. Or women's opportunities are lower. We need to equalize that in some way. 
And then once you've actually equalized it, okay, everything's okay now, and uh, we don't have to change things any further. So, you know, let's take opportunities. What would be some opportunities that women have traditionally, um, not in your generation, but in previous generations, been pushed out of or kept out of? <coughs> What's that? Voting. Yeah, the women's vote. Um, not until last century. Uh, and, and in France, it, it, it took even longer than it did here in the United States. So voting, that's pretty important. And, you know, if you can't vote, then you can't change things. What else? What are some other things you remember from your history classes or sociology classes? Yeah. Um, women weren't allowed to work, or like most of them just sit at. Yeah, they were. They were fairly restricted. They, I mean, they were allowed to work. Yeah. If we, if we just understand work in general, but there were a lot of professions that they just couldn't get into, and there, and there's still a lot of you know professions today where it's still very male dominated. It's not impossible to get in, but you know, if you want to be a union uh, electrician, that's a pretty male-dominated group of guys, um, and they're, they're not all equally receptive to the idea of, uh, of a female electrician. Um, as a matter of fact, you might actually do better to get out of a union context than into a, an open shop if you want to do that sort of thing. Um, what else? What are some other opportunities that women didn't have as much access to or didn't have access to? Yeah. Were um, they not allowed to own property at one point? Yeah. There were uh, quite a few states where um, a woman couldn't actually be the, what do you call it, the, the owner, the, there's a special name in legal fields for that. But yeah, and, that, and that's crippling, isn't it? You, you can't dispose of property. What about education? <clears throat> There, there's a reason why people before your generation, and actually before mine, used to use the word co-ed a lot. Nobody uses that these days, do they? What's a co-ed? You're a co-ed. Because you're, you're a female student. At least you would have been back in the 1960s when that was seen as not the norm. I mean, nowadays, there's more women in college than there are men in college. And actually, women tend to do better in college, by the way, than, than men do. So, you know, she's saying you can't just try to fix things. You have to radically transform institutions, ways of looking at things. That would be what we call gender feminism. That's saying you can't just equalize the playing field. You have to, you have to change the way in which we look at everything. So she says to continue to build morality on rational principles opposed to the emotions and, and to include women among the, irash, uh, among the rational will leave no one to reflect the promptings of the heart. So if we take her view of a male approach to things, a male approach to things would be reason or rationality as opposed to the emotions. Um, she's saying that, that you know, women have been identified with the emotions and the emotions have been overlooked when it comes to moral theory as a way of deciding things, as a way of figuring things out. And you know, if you look at Kant or utilitarianism, this makes good sense, doesn't it? Even Plato, Plato was you know, very distrustful of the emotions. Um, if we say, well, women can be rational, so we're going to bring them into that, but we ignore the emotional side of women just as much as we ignore the emotional side of men, we're still ignoring the emotional side, aren't we? We're not changing moral theory for the better just by saying, okay, now women can be just as rational as men. We're still leaving something out. So she says this also about um, the public and the, uh, the sort of private or household sphere. She says, to bring women into the public and male domain of the polis, the political community, will leave no one to speak for the household. So another thing that's been sort of ignored in moral theory is there's a lot of focus on what goes on in society, and especially in political society, and less emphasis on what goes on in the household and what actually goes on in the household. Well, that's where childbearing and child rearing takes place. And this is a really important function because, you know, why are kids so screwed up? You know, every, every generation of adults um, looks at, at some generation of kids and says they're, they're very screwed up, at least in the last, you know, five, six generations. Uh, and actually, if you read history, 
and literature, you'll find people making this complaint throughout all of history, just about. Um, well, how do kids get screwed up? What's your experience? You guys, you know, are a pretty well squared away set of uh, young men and women. You were considered just kids, you know, five, six years ago, right? You were mixing with a lot of other ones. Not everybody, you know, went the path that, that you went. Some people have, you know, dropped out. Some people have, have uh, gotten themselves in a lot of trouble. What determined those sort of shifts in your experience? I'm willing to bet you guys know a lot of people who made bad choices. Yeah. Like parenting. That's a big part of it, isn't it? Um, and now, now, held is really only focusing on, on women. You know, it's interesting, since the 90s, we've learned a lot about the role of, of fathers in um, determining outcomes. Not, not necessarily determining, as in, you know, like, mechanical, it's automatically going to be this way. But we've learned that if you want to find out how children are going to do in school, one great way of figuring that out is look at their relationship with their father and what kind of person their father is. Um, but mothering is extremely important, too. Probably more important in, in a lot of respects than fathering. Um, without certain kinds of interaction, a child can't thrive. Without other kinds of interaction, a child can't even start to form proper attachments to other people. So, you know, if we just push women into the public sphere, and we say, well, you know, a woman can be president, a woman can be this, a woman can be that, you know, a CEO, anything, but we ignore this whole domestic sphere, we're not actually changing moral theory for the better. That's the point she's making. And the last one has to do with um, the value of relationships. She says, to continue to see contractual restraints on the pursuits of self-interest by atomistic individuals. What, what are atomistic individuals? Does that mean you're made of atoms? No. You're, we're all made of atoms, right? Atomistic individuals means each one of you is an individual first, outside of a whole fabric of relationships, and you're just an individual, and then you're only in the relationships that you're in, and those only matter because you have chosen them yourself. That's not really the case for who you are, is it? Did any of you choose who your parents are going to be? I doubt it. I mean, it would be extraordinary if you had. Um, you could conceive of a case like a kid is going to be adopted when they're maybe 12 years old and they can choose between this set of parents and this set of parents. And, but who does that ever happen to, right? Um, now, along with your parents, did any other relationships come as part of the package for you? Brothers, sisters. Well, yeah, cause you, and, you, and you, you didn't decide that, right? Your parents decided that by what they did. Um, and you may have actually pleaded with them, please, please don't have another child. Um, but, you know, you get them anyway. Or they came before you, right? Um, what else? Who else comes as a part of the package? With your, yeah. And your grandparents. Yeah, I mean, they're, your parents had parents too, right? And maybe aunts and uncles and cousins, and pretty soon you got this whole penumbra of all these different relationships that you never chose. And you can, like, leave them behind if you want to. And just, you know, be an atomistic individual who only enters into relationships that they want. But that's pretty rare, isn't it? <laughs> Most people actually have quite a few relationships. And, you know, your parents chose a particular place to live. And that meant that a lot of your relationships with the people that you went to school with and became friends with, those contingent relationships, that's partly determined by the fabric of, you know, networks that you were thrown into. If you had any particular interests that, you know, led you to be friends with this person because you both were in the band together or on this team together or, you know, even dormed in the same place and then found you like the same music or the same kind of videos, you know, that's not being an atomistic individual. Uh, and a lot of moral theory has represented us as if we are these people who are um, all by ourselves to begin with, and then only then do we branch out and, and hook up with other people. So, if we say, well, you know, we're going to let women come into the club and be just as atomistic individuals as men, that's not actually going to fix things. What we want to do is figure out why do relationships matter so much? What kind of relationships are good relationships? Not just, you know, matters of contracts or things like that.
So she's saying that, that um, unless we do these sorts of things, unless we bring about these kinds of transformations, moral theory is going to be, you might say, held back. And she, um, um, yeah, she, she talks about this as not only being a matter of importance for women, but also for men. She says, um, the images of the feminine is what must be overcome if knowledge and morality is to be achieved. You know, emotion, relationships, this domesticity, you know, where you came from, you might say. Uh, a female experience is naturally irrelevant to, to morality and women as inherently deficient moral creatures. That's built into the history of ethics. And if you go back and you look at um, quite a few things that some of the people you've been reading say, not, not the sections I have you read, um, but other sections, you know, you can find Aristotle actually saying, yeah, women are, are deficient. They, they can never be fully rational. Kant even thought that. Um, now, you know, did he have good grounds for thinking that? I would say no. Held thinks that that was sort of, you know, coming out of their culture and it inevitably pushed their, their thinking in a certain way that makes it not as useful for, for today, for conditions where we actually do want to have, you know, men and women, say, doing moral theory or working in the workplace together or maybe, you know, both caring about child rearing. Um, and she says, feminists examine these images. They see that they're not the incidental or merely idiosyncratic suppositions of a few philosophers. It's not that Kant was just, you know, off that day when he was writing it. That was part of, you know, his, his mindset. And you can find the same thing in Bentham. John Stuart Mill would be kind of an interesting exam uh, uh, an exception because he's actually um, arguing for the rights of women, uh, unlike a lot of these people. Um, but she says, such views are the nearly uniform reflection in philosophical and ethical theory of patriarchal attitudes pervasive throughout human, human history. What are, what are patriarchal attitudes? That's a word that you guys have heard in other classes. What does patriarchy mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it means literally men, men ruling or men running the show. Um, and we, you know, we just talked about this. Anytime that you have one particular group that's privileged, that's in charge, they're inevitably going to see things their way and they're going to make everybody else, you know, fit into those categories. Now, um, is this good for women? She's saying no. Is this good for men? She also thinks no. She says, um, a lot of these patriarchal ideas are exaggerations of ordinary male experiences, which exaggerations then reinforce rather than temper other patriarchal conceptions and institutions. They distort the actual experience and aspirations of many men as well as women. This is something worth thinking about. Um, and, and this is where I think, in some ways, this may be a little dated. Um, so I want, you know, I want you guys to think about this. Reason or rationality versus emotion. Do we, in fact, today still associate women more with emotion and men more with reasoning or or rationality, you know, sort of a cold, logical approach to things. I mean, if you read stuff like, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, sure, right? Um, but I'm not sure that that represents your experience quite so much. I'm not even sure that represents my experience quite so much. Um, are we in a culture where men are allowed to feel, show, think about, emotions, let's say we compare where we are today to what you would think, say, the 1950s would be like. Or even the 1970s. You ever watch any of those 70s movies? Everybody's macho all the time, you know. There, there are some sensitive men, and they're like the wimps over on the side. Here'd be a good question. Are men allowed to cry in today's society? Or is that like, wow, you've gone beyond the pale. You, you, you're no longer a man. What, what's your experience? I mean, there's some cases where if you cry, you're going to get made fun of, right? There's plenty of cases where if, if women cry, they're going to get made fun of too, right? If you're, if you're in, you know, 
Ultimate Fighter. Doesn't matter whether you're a guy or a girl. If you're crying, you know, you don't belong there. But what about ordinary life? Let's say you're you're in a, a workplace, and your colleague has had a death in the family, and they're they're really distracted, and uh, you need a report from them because your work depends on this, and your boss is on your case about this report, right? Think about this sort of like you're doing, or, you know, if, if you're not a business person, think about this like you're. Um, doing a group project with them. And there's always somebody who's like late with their group stuff. This is why all of you don't like doing group work quite so much, because you know, they're at risk of that. So you confront them about that, and they burst into tears. Now, how would you, how would you view that? Is it OK for them to do that? I mean, they're not actually saying, I won't get it done, because you know, I'm feeling bad, and I'm going to cry. Is it OK for them to cry? Does it matter if it's a man or a woman? No. What, what do the rest of you think? I agree. Yeah? yeah? How do you think your grandparents would have seen that? Most of you, I think your grandparents are still alive, so you've got, you know, you can figure out how they would have interpreted it. They're in the workplace, somebody's sad, and they actually start, they break down crying in the workplace. <clears throat> Yeah. I feel like back in the day, people weren't like as accepting. Like they were accepting of it, but it was like I don't know. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Well, my grandpa would have been like, "Get your shit together." Yeah. <laughs> so did <laughs> my. <laughs> so did my dad. My dad would have been like, "I don't know what's wrong with you." You know, what were you saying? I mean, I think that, and I mean, I'm a little bit older than you guys, so I come from a different time. You're my age. Yeah, so we, we come from a different time. And even today, I think that if we find a woman crying, yeah, we will accept that as okay. If we come across a man crying, I will question what the hell is wrong with him. <laughs> Why are you crying? There is no reason for you to cry. Yeah, I think it, sometimes it depends on context too. Yeah, I was gonna say situation as well. Like you, you went back to like the Ultimate Fighter. Yeah, you're saying like he has not crying. I totally disagree. How about I saw it? an Ultimate Fighter crying. I'm not gonna say anything. Dude, beat the crap out of me. <laughs> you see that point? It's also like situation and timing. It's like depending on what he's crying about, where he's crying. It's like yeah. It's like if the girl's crying in the workplace, I probably personally don't get your shit together. Well, if you're crying outside of the workplace, I'd probably feel more comfortable. That's interesting. Like, if it's like my project that I got to get done and you're crying, it's like, yo, let's go get it together. You're a girl, no, you're my coworker. It's yeah. Like, that's how I, I mean, I don't want you to think I'm But, like that, but like, somebody in the family just died. Like that. It's not like I'm crying. If my like, deadlines do, I'm crying over my job down here. Oh, what? Yeah. Oh. It's like, no. <laughs> so at the least we can say there's kind of a tension there, right? There, there's, yeah. Yeah, I feel like if you came across a girl crying, you wouldn't, or came across a guy crying, you would assume that the situation or whatever happened to them was a lot more severe. But if you came across That's uh, interesting. a girl crying, you wouldn't necessarily assume that. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know. That that's a good one to think about. Yeah. Cool. I was at a bar. Yeah. And, uh, People cry a lot in bars. Up too. here, yeah. That's what I was about to say. I've seen a hell of a lot of girls crying. And it's like, all right, like, what did God do to make a guy? Yeah. And if I see a guy crying, I'm like, all right, like, what the hell's the matter with this kid? So it might, it might really depend on context, right? Yeah. On, I mean, on, on where we are. Well, um, I think people, uh, but I think that the, that the one thing that I'm hearing is that people will question why a man is crying. In some contexts, yeah. In, in most contexts, I mean, but in Maybe. when a woman is crying, yeah, they're not asking... They're going to question why they're crying, but they're going to be more accepting of that. They're not going to look at it as critically as they would see a man crying. <clears throat> I think there's definitely more, a more critical judgment when you see a man crying. There's, there's a certain... Well, I suspect that it, it's somewhat generational. I think that our generation, we tend to be more um, strict about that sort of stuff. And certainly our parents' generation, way more strict about that. Um, uh, 
but let's so let's go on from from this. So think about other types of rationality versus emotion. Um, is it good for for men to have to leave that behind? Maybe not. Maybe that needs to be integrated into moral theory, or you know the experience of this domestic sphere. You know she's putting it in terms of just childbearing and child rearing. I, I like to think of it as where you come from. Does that matter in moral theory? You know, when we looked at Alistair McIntyre earlier on in the semester, didn't he say that that was really central? Your narrative, you know, you ask the questions that you do in moral theory, <clears throat> not abstractly, but in the, the situation that you're actually living in. You don't ask necessarily what is the good for human beings, but you ask what is the good for me. And if that has to do with where you come from, maybe where you're going back to, um, the sort of thing that you would like to replicate too, I think, when you have your own family, um, then maybe she's onto the right track with this. Something gets left out if we reduce moral theory just to the public sphere. And then relationships. You know, um, is your is yourself is your uh, way in which you carry out moral theorizing or answering these sort of questions. Um, should that be done as sort of an abstract individual all by yourself, you know, the categorical imperative or Bentham's greatest happiness principle? Or do your relationships really matter? Um, you know, when we looked at Ross, didn't Ross seem to offer that kind of, that kind of idea? You know, duties of gratitude, for example. Who do you have duties of gratitude to? Who do you feel duties of gratitude to? Marist, of course, for offering you all these great opportunities and all that. But is that really where your heart is when it comes to that? Who are you most grateful to? <clears throat> I think so, yeah. For At least at this stage in your life. Um, maybe later on it will be something like your, you know, your, your spouse or even your own children or um, another, another teacher. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say about, about this before we move on to the next thing is she is um, kind of vague about what, what exactly ethics of care or feminist ethics would ex you know, completely entail. What would this radical transformation look like? Um, she doesn't give you a blueprint for that. She just, she's a lot more uh, you know, strong on the critical side than she is on the, the constructive side. And she says, you know, there's dialogues that are enabling feminist approaches uh, to moral theory to, to develop. And there's no one single view of ethics can, that can be identified as feminist ethics. Feminist ethics, by the way, is not necessarily the same thing as ethics of care. You could perhaps um, recognize some of the, the truths in the ethics of care without tying in with some sort of you know, big, grand feminist program. So that's something worth, worth thinking about.